Have you ever put an ice cube in a heated skillet and watch it transform from ice to water, then to evaporate out of the pan and make steam? What you're seeing is that piece of matter changing in its state. Hey everyone, welcome to this video on the states of matter. There are three primary states that matter exists in, gas, liquid, and solid. However, in very extreme cases, matter can exist in other states, like plasma, more specifically, hot plasma. Gas. Within a gas, particles have large gaps of space, and there's no specific pattern to their arrangements. The particles move very quickly and freely. Since there's a lot of space between particles, gas is compressible. Gas can easily flow since particles dart past each other, and gas takes the shape and volume of the container that it's in, since the particles move freely. Liquid. Particles within a liquid are much closer together, but they also do not have a specific arranged pattern. These liquid particles move, but not quite like gas particles. They vibrate, slowly move about, and they can also move past each other. Because the particles can move, a liquid can fill the shape of the container it's in. However, it will not fill the whole space like gas, depending on the volume of water to volume of container ratio. Since there is not as much space between the particles, liquid is not easily compressible. Liquid can flow pretty effortlessly, which is due to the particle's ability to slide and move past each other. Solids. Now, particles within a solid are very, very close together with very little, if any, space between each other. And they are generally arranged in a specific pattern. Typically, solids do not move about, but they will vibrate in place. A solid has an already fixed volume and shape, since there is little to no major movements of the particles. A solid is also not easy to compress because of the lack of space between the particles already. Solids do not flow easily because of the lack of movement of the particles and their inability to move past each other. Now, plasma. I mentioned that this only happens in extreme cases. Plasma is extremely hot gas that is ionized. Plasma has significantly different characteristics than the other three states of matter, so it is thought of as the very distinct fourth state of matter. However, it is closest in similarity to that of a gas. Having an understanding of what's going on with the particles within matter is very important. They're not just simply tiny pieces of solid or liquid or gas, they are molecules and atoms. What is happening with those molecules and atoms, their physical characteristics, is what decides their state. Magnetism is one area of physics that most people have first-hand experience with, since magnets are fairly common everyday objects. Today we'll be looking at different types of magnets and seeing just how magnetism works. So, what are magnets exactly? Simply put, Magnets are materials that have a magnetic field. The magnetic field of a magnet is invisible, but it does have a visible effect when it repels or attracts other magnets in its presence. An example I'm sure you're familiar with is a refrigerator magnet. We know that both the magnet and the refrigerator door are magnetic and have a magnetic field because the magnet sticks to the refrigerator door. Every magnet has a north and south pole. The north pole of one magnet and the south pole of a different magnet will experience an attractive magnetic force when they are near each other, while the north to north and south to south poles experience a repulsive force when they are near each other. In order to describe magnetic fields, we draw magnetic field lines that come out of the North Pole and reconnect to the magnet of the South Pole. Magnetic field lines will never cross, and they will either loop back around to the opposite pole of the same magnet or connect to another nearby magnet. Technically, the field lines continue through the magnet, creating a closed loop. The denser these lines are, the stronger the magnetic field is in that spot. And as you might expect, if the magnetic field is strong, the magnetic force is strong as well. As a simple experiment, 
This concept can be visualized by sprinkling magnetic iron shavings around a magnet. The shavings will actually align themselves with the magnetic field. To make things even more interesting, you can add more magnets and see how the field lines change. It is important to note the relationship between magnetic fields and electric current. Moving charges create electric current. Anytime there is an electric current, there is also a magnetic field around it. The magnetic field disappears when the current is stopped. On a much smaller scale, magnets actually consist of many tiny magnets. The electrons naturally have their own magnetic fields because they are moving charges, even when bound in the orbitals around the atoms. For most materials, the electron orbitals are arranged such that all the tiny fields created by the electrons cancel each other out. This results in no magnetic properties. However, in some materials, the magnetic fields of the electrons are not all canceled out, which encourages neighboring atoms to line up with the field. If enough fields align, then all of those tiny magnetic fields add up to one big magnetic field, making the material magnetic. This state doesn't often occur naturally, but it can. In some materials, it is possible to align all of the tiny magnets and create a magnetic material. This occurs when the randomly oriented magnetic fields of electrons have the ability to change orientation. This property is referred to as ferromagnetism. Ferromagnetic materials are used to make artificial magnets, like those on your refrigerator. Rare earth metals, such as samarium and neodymium, exhibit this kind of behavior. In order to magnetize a material, it must be submerged in a strong external magnetic field. The magnetic fields of the electrons in the material will then align themselves with the external field and remain that way. The ability of the ferromagnet to retain its magnetic ability depends on the material. Some artificial magnets are permanent, while others are only magnetic when they are exposed to another magnetic field. However, even permanent magnets will lose their imposed magnetic field at a certain high temperature, called the Curie temperature. Each type of magnetic material has a different Curie temperature. Magnets can also occur naturally, although naturally occurring magnets are generally weaker than artificial magnets. The strongest natural magnet on Earth is magnetite, an iron oxide also known as lodestone. A few other naturally occurring magnetic materials are hematite and pyrotite, which are both relatively weak magnets. Aside from minerals, the Earth itself actually has its own magnetic field, and although it is weak, it protects us by deflecting certain dangerous particles from our atmosphere. Although it is not intuitive, what we refer to as the North Pole is actually the South Pole of Earth's magnetic field, and the geographic south is the north end of the magnet. Now that we've learned all about magnets and how they work, let's test your knowledge with some review questions. Number one, how would you draw the field lines coming out of the North Pole of Magnet A if it was put right in the middle of the North Pole and South Pole of Magnets B and C? A, half of the lines coming from the Magnet A would connect to the North Pole of Magnet B, and the other half would connect to the south pole of magnet C. B. The lines coming out of the north pole of magnet A would all avoid the north pole of magnet B as much as possible and connect with the south pole of magnet C. C. The magnetic field lines in each magnet would still come out of the north pole and only connect to its own south pole, so all the three magnet lines would just cross each other. The correct answer is B. Field lines will always go from the North Pole to the closest South Pole and will never cross each other. Number two, 
Given the arrangement of magnets, which of the following would you expect to happen if the magnets are fixed at their midpoints but freely able to rotate? A, B, C. The correct answer is B. The magnets will rotate as little as possible, but will turn toward opposing poles. Hi, and welcome to this video on electric charge. In this video, we're going to look at what electric charge is and how it's measured. Electric charge is a fundamental property of matter. All physical things in the universe are made up of matter. All matter is made up of atoms, and atoms are made up of particles. These particles can be positively charged, negatively charged, or neutral. Protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged, and neutrons have no charge at all, making them neutral. One property of electric charge is that it is additive. This means that when multiple charges of the same kind are put together, they add up to one big charge, be it positive or negative. And if we have a mixture of positive and negative charges, we can find the net charge of the overall mixture. For example, if we have an object made up of 14 protons, which are positive, and 12 electrons, which are negative, then we end up with a net charge of positive 2. We simply add one for each proton and subtract one for each electron. If the resulting number is positive, we have a net positive charge. And if the resulting number is negative, we'll have a net negative charge. Note that neutral particles will make no difference in the net charge. It's also important to understand the interaction between charged particles. All electrically charged particles exert a force on all other electrically charged particles, aptly named the electric force. The electric force is described by the equation F equals K times Q1 times Q2 all over D squared where K is Coulomb's constant. Q1 and Q2 are the two different charges exerting a force on each other, and D is the distance between the centers of the two charges. Note that the sign for each of the charges will impact whether the force between them is attractive or repulsive. Specifically, if the calculated force is negative, opposite signs on the charges, then the force is attractive. If the calculated force is positive, same signs on the charges, then the force is repulsive. Note that since distance is in the denominator of the equation, the closer the two charged objects are to each other, the stronger the force is between them. Another interesting property of electrically charged objects is the electric field surrounding them. We can think of the electric field as lines emanating from the surface of the charged object. For negatively charged objects, we draw the lines with arrows pointing inward to the object. And for positively charged objects, we draw the arrows pointing outward. The closer and denser the lines are, the stronger the field is in that spot. Theoretically, these lines go on forever, but get weaker the further away they are from the charge. For two like charges, electric field lines will avoid each other and the electric force will push the objects apart. For opposite charges, the electric field lines will actually connect the two charges and the electric force will draw them closer together. Visually, this is demonstrated by lines that extend all the way from the positive charge to the negative charge, indicating an attraction. All charged particles or objects in an electric field will experience the electric force. The equation for electric field is E equals K times Q all over D squared, where K is Coulomb's constant, Q is the charge of the object whose electric field we're measuring, and D is the distance from the charged object whose electric field we're measuring to the spot where we want to determine E. The value of the electric field changes depending on where you are. This is similar to the electric force, and it can be pretty easy to mix up the two equations. 
So it's important to remember that the electric force describes the interaction between two objects and therefore includes a Q1 and Q2, and the electric field describes the field of one object, so it only has one Q. Charge, of course, is not limited to point particles like this. We can have large objects with a net positive or negative charge as well. Charge that is built up on object is called static electricity. Objects handle the buildup of charge in a few different ways. The two main categories are conductors and insulators. Conductors have electrons with the ability to move freely on them and therefore have the ability to have a flow of electrical charge through them. Since the electrons can move, the charge will disperse as much as possible for the given shape of the conductor. So, when a conductor, piece of metal, has attracted extra electrons, it will have a net negative charge dispersed over its surface. An insulator, on the other hand, does not have the ability to have freely flowing electrons and cannot have a flow of electrical charge like a conductor. They can still build up a static charge, but it will be localized since it cannot disperse. Common examples of insulators are glass and wood. Now that we have an understanding of what electric charge is and how it causes electric forces and fields, let's think about some examples. Number one, what is the net charge of an atom composed of 17 protons, 17 neutrons, and 18 electrons? Is it A, negative one, B, positive one, C, zero, or D, negative 18? The answer is A, negative one. Neutrons have no effect on the charge, so negative 18 plus 17 equals negative 1. Number two, imagine a very large metal plate that has a net negative charge. In the middle of the plate, just above it, you place an ionized helium atom containing two protons, two neutrons, and one electron. What will happen to this atom? A. The atom will move directly upward, away from the plate. B. The atom will move directly downward, toward the plate. C. The atom will remain where it is. Or D. The atom will move to the right. The answer is B. Since there are more protons than electrons in the ionized helium atom, it has a net positive charge and would be attracted to the negatively charged plate and move downward. You plug in your cell phone to charge. You hear the roar of a car engine as it starts. You turn on a flashlight when the power goes out. These are a few examples of electric circuits. They bring electricity from a power source to an item that converts that power into something else. These circuits are made up of a power source, wires, and other components like switches and resistors. Think about the plumbing in a house. The pipes deliver water to places where you use the water, like your sink and shower. Similarly, electric circuits deliver electricity to items and places that can use that electricity, like a light bulb, refrigerator, or TV. Circuits deliver electricity using the flow of electrons through wires, and this flow is called an electrical current. Just like the water pipes create a flow of water molecules making up the water current, the circuit creates a flow of electrons making up the electric current. Current is measured in amperes, which is a unit of measure that tells us how many electrons are flowing through a point in one second. In order to cause the electric current to flow, a voltage is applied to the circuit. A voltage difference causes the electrons to flow, just like a change in water pressure causes the water to flow. We can also think of voltage like the pulsing of your heart to push blood through your body. Your heart pushes on your blood to create blood flow, just like voltage pushes on electrons to create current. Voltage is measured in volts, a unit of measure that tells us how good our power source is at pushing an electron. Just like water pipes have ways for the water to flow to be slowed, electric circuits also have ways for electric current to be slowed. This is called resistance. Resistance is like the diameter of the water pipe. A larger diameter water pipe has less resistance than a small diameter water pipe. 
Every material has an electrical resistance, and it is measured in ohms. We use the Greek letter omega to represent an ohm. This unit of measure tells us how easy it is for our electric current to move through the material. The wires in an electrical circuit have resistance, R. It is determined by the length of the wire, L, the resistivity of the wire, rho, and the diameter of the wire, d, through the equation r equals rho times l divided by d. In most circuits, we want the wires delivering the current to have as small a resistance as possible so the current can flow easily. However, high resistance can be useful in some situations. An incandescent bulb has a twisted piece of wire in it. When you flip the switch to turn on the light, the voltage pushes the current through the wire, which has a very high resistance, so it is difficult for the current to move through. The wire begins to heat up. Eventually, the wire is so hot, light is created. Light bulbs show us one way electricity can be used to change one form of energy to another. We are changing electrical energy into light and heat energy. Voltage V, current I, and resistance R are related through Ohm's law, V equals I R. From this relationship, we see that increasing resistance while keeping the current the same means the voltage must increase. It's like using your thumb to spray water from a hose. You have increased the resistance for the water to flow through the hose, so more pressure is needed to keep the same water current flowing. Resistors can be linked together in a long chain. This is called a series circuit. Linking resistors in this way means each resistor receives the exact same current. However, the voltage drops across each resistor are dependent on its resistance, R. Suppose we have three resistors in a row, R1, R2, and R3. We would like to replace these three resistors with only one resistor that has the same resistance as the original series. This is called an equivalent resistance. Since the current is the same in each resistor, the relationship is additive. R1 plus R2 plus R3 equals R equivalent. It's like connecting two garden hoses together. The hoses are in series and it takes more water pressure to push the water through the hoses. Similarly, it takes more voltage to push the current through many resistors in series. An example of resistors in series is a string of old Christmas lights. The light bulbs form a series of resistors. Each bulb has a resistance. If one bulb burns out, the entire string of lights does not light up. This is because the current has been cut off. To make the lights work again, you need to find the broken bulb and replace it, which can take a while. Newer strings of lights don't have this problem because the resistors are in parallel. This means they each have the same voltage across them, but different currents. If one bulb burns out, the rest of the bulbs still work because they still have current. The equivalent resistance of resistors in parallel is 1 divided by R equivalent equals 1 divided by R1 plus 1 divided by R2 plus 1 divided by R3. This relationship follows from Ohm's law, which shows us how the current branches into different resistors. Let's wrap up with a review question. I want to string together 15 strings of Christmas lights. As I add more and more Christmas lights to my string, the lights get dimmer and dimmer. Why? A, I do not have enough Christmas spirit. B, adding more lights adds more resistance. Or C, Adding more lights adds more voltage. The answer is B. The Christmas lights add more resistance through more bulbs and more electrical wire. The strings of lights lose more energy to the wire's resistance as it gets longer. Remember the definition of resistance? And the bulbs receive less voltage. Hi, and welcome to this video on kinetic and potential energy. Energy is a very important concept in physics that helps us describe how much work an object can do. While the word energy is often used in everyday language, the meaning in physics is very specific and may not exactly coincide with the meanings you are used to hearing. Today, we'll be looking at the different types of energy and how they affect the world around us every day. There are two main categories of energy. 
kinetic energy and potential energy. Kinetic energy applies to objects in motion. Potential energy is the stored energy of an object and depends on the object's position. Different types of energy may express energy values in different combinations of units, but the standard unit for energy is the joule. First, let's talk about kinetic energy. Since kinetic energy applies to moving objects, it is dependent on the object's velocity. The equation for kinetic energy is kinetic energy equals one-half times the mass times the velocity squared. Here, it is apparent that when V equals zero, the kinetic energy is also equal to zero. This makes sense because if the object is at rest, it won't have any kinetic energy. Also, kinetic energy is directly proportional to the mass of the object and the velocity squared. So the faster an object is moving, and the heavier it is, the higher the kinetic energy will be. Kinetic energy is closely related to work. In physics, work is a measure of the energy it takes to move something a given distance. A force must act on the object in order to move it and cause work to be done. You must take all of the forces acting on the object into consideration when thinking about the total amount of work that was done on the object. So, the equation for work in terms of force and distance is the net work done on an object, W net, equals the net force that acted on the object, F net, times the distance over which the work was done, or D. However, it is sometimes more useful to think of work in terms of energy. The work energy theorem states that work is equal to the change in the kinetic energy of an object. So, work is equal to the final value of the kinetic energy minus the initial value of the kinetic energy. It is also important to note that work can be either positive or negative. For example, if you are pushing a box across a table, the direction you're pushing the box would be considered positive direction. The friction between the box and the table is a force in the direction opposite to the motion, so the work being done by friction is negative. Basically, negative work makes it more difficult to get positive work done. Let's think about an example using the work energy theorem. Imagine you are standing at the top of a building and you are holding a ball over the edge. While you are holding the ball over the edge, it is at rest. If you let it go, it will be in free fall until it reaches the ground and is at rest again. There are several questions we need to ask here. Are there any forces at work here? If so, what are they? Is work being done when you drop the ball? Does the amount of work change as the ball falls to the ground? To answer the first question, yes, there is a force at work here. The force that is acting here is gravity. Specifically, the force of gravity equals mass times the object's acceleration. Gravity is pulling the ball to the ground when you drop it, and the acceleration due to gravity, g, is making the ball go faster and faster as it gets closer to the ground. The positive direction here is downward in the direction of the movement. Since there is kinetic energy when the ball is moving, remember it has velocity, then work is being done on the ball by gravity. So what is the total amount of work being done here from when the ball is at rest to the time it hits the ground? Well, the velocity is zero at both of those times. So the total work done is zero after the ball hits the ground. This is because the normal force of the ground pushes upward on the ball and causes negative work to be done. The work from gravity is then canceled out at that point. However, if we look at the amount of work done when the ball is only halfway to the ground, we will have a non-zero value of kinetic energy since the ball has a non-zero velocity. When we plug this into the work energy theorem with one-half times the mass times the initial velocity squared equals zero, we will get a non-zero value for work. So, the value for the amount of work done will change depending on where the ball is on its way to the ground. So where does potential energy come in? 
potential energy depends on an object's position. Unlike kinetic energy, an object can have a non-zero potential energy when it is at rest or when it is moving. The example where we are dropping the ball from the building involves a form of potential energy called gravitational potential energy. As you might imagine, the name comes from the fact that we are dealing with the gravitational force. The equation that we use for gravitational potential energy is gravitational potential energy equals mass times acceleration times the height of the object from the ground. So, in our previous example, the potential energy is at its highest when you are holding the ball at the top of the building because h is at its maximum value. The mass of the ball is not changing here, and g is always 9.8 meters per second squared near the surface of the Earth. So the potential energy is entirely dependent on how far away the ball is from the ground in this problem. When the ball hits the ground, it has no more potential energy. It's important to understand that during the fall from the top of the building to the ground, the ball has both kinetic and potential energy, and both are constantly changing. If you look again at the equation for gravitational potential energy, you might notice that the mg is actually the gravitational force acting on the object. And when we multiply that by the distance the object travels, we get the work done against gravity or by gravity, depending on the direction. So if you're lifting the object up from the ground, you're doing work against gravity. And when the object is in free fall, gravity is doing the work. Work must be computed over some distance or some change in h. It doesn't make sense to ask what the work is at one point, say, three meters above the ground. For work, you might ask something like, what is the work done when you lift the ball from a height of two meters to a height of three meters? So the work done by gravity is actually equal to the change of potential energy. Another type of potential energy is elastic potential energy. Elastic potential energy involves any type of object that can be compressed, stretched, or otherwise deformed in such a way that it wants to move back into an equilibrium position. Common examples are springs or rubber bands. Elastic materials all have a spring constant, K, that is dependent on the material and describes how elastic it is. The force of a compressed or stretched spring is described by Hooke's law, where k is the spring constant and delta x is the distance that the spring has been displaced. When the spring is in a stretched or compressed state, the potential energy associated with this state is potential energy of the spring equals one half times k times delta x squared. So let's think about an example of a typical spring problem. Imagine a spring attached to a wall. When the spring is not compressed or stretched, the end of the spring rests at the spot we will call x equals zero. At this point, it has no stored energy. If you compress the spring by pushing it to the left, you've moved it by a distance delta x, and it now has stored or potential energy. The force of the spring is pressing in the opposite direction of the direction that you've compressed it. Conversely, if you stretch the spring by delta x, the force now points in the opposite direction. The elastic potential energy is the same here if delta x is the same. Now that we've learned all about kinetic energy, potential energy, and work, let's test it out with some problems. Let's say you have a bowling ball of mass m on a ramp that is height h from the ground. What is the potential energy when it is at rest at the top of the ramp and when it is at a height of one-third times h? Is it a, zero, zero, b, zero, one-third mgh, c, mgh, one-third mgh, or d, mgh, impossible to tell without knowing how long the ramp is.
The correct answer is C. The bowling ball will have potential energy as long as it is on the ramp, so it won't be zero until it reaches the ground. At the top, it is a height of h from the ground, and when it is at a height of one-third h, that is how far it is from the ground. The path it takes doesn't matter. In this same example, how much total work is done from the time the bowling ball is going a speed of v to the time that it hits the ground, assuming it stops when it hits the ground? Is it a negative one-half mv squared, b one-half mv squared, or c zero? The correct answer is A. Here the initial velocity equals V and the final velocity equals zero because the bowling ball is stopped by the ground. Plugging these into the work energy theorem, we get negative one-half mv squared. The reason work is negative here is that we have to take into account the work done by the ground to stop the ball. This value is the network of the ball-ground system. Imagine you have a spring with spring constant k hanging from the ceiling. In its equilibrium position, it is a height of 2 meters off of the ground. What is the elastic potential energy of the spring when you pull it down until it is only 1.5 meters off the ground? Is it a 2k, b 1 8th k, c k, or d? 9 eighths k. The correct answer is b. You've displaced the spring by 2 minus 1.5 equals 0 0.5, or 1 half meters. Plugging this into potential energy of the spring equation, you get 1 eighth k. Imagine running forward and jumping onto a spinning merry-go-round. At first, you are running in a straight line, but as you land, your motion changes and you begin to spin. How is your running speed related to your spinning speed? Let's find out. First, recall that speed is the distance traveled over a particular time interval. Cars have a speedometer, which tells us how fast the car is going in miles per hour. Miles is the units of distance and hours is the units of time. Linear speed tells us how fast a point on a rotating object is traveling. The distance the point travels depends on how far it is from the center of rotation. A point further from the center of rotation travels farther than a point closer to the center of rotation. The time is how long it takes for the object to complete one revolution. We calculate the linear speed of a point using a few different methods. First, we need to find the distance traveled by the point, and to do that, we need to know how far the point is from the center of rotation. This is the radius of the circle the object creates while rotating. Let's call this r. Next, we need to measure how far the point has rotated. This is the angle the object has traveled through, theta, which is measured in radians or degrees. Once we have these two measurements, we calculate the arc length, which is the distance the point has traveled. We call this distance s, and the equation we use is s equals r times theta. Now that we have the distance traveled, we measure the time taken to travel this distance, t, and find the linear speed. Linear speed is equal to s over t, which is equal to r times theta over t. Sometimes we know how fast something is rotating, and we want to calculate the linear speed. Usually, we know how many revolutions per minute the object makes, so let's connect RPM and linear speed. Recall an angle can be measured with two different units, radians or degrees. A full revolution is 2 pi radians, or 360 degrees. When converting between rotating speed and linear speed, the units we use depend on the final answer we want. Let's use radians first. Suppose we have a wheel spinning at omega RPM with a radius of r meters. What's the linear speed in meters per second of a point on the outermost edge of the tire? We can use simple unit analysis to find our answer. First, we know our wheel spins through 2 pi radians each revolution. But how do we relate radians to a length with units of meters? Imagine wrapping our wheel with a piece of string. This string makes one revolution around our wheel. It measures 2 pi radians. 
Now, let's take that piece of string, lay it flat, and measure its length with a ruler. We will find the length is 2 pi r meters. So with each revolution, our wheel travels 2 pi r meters. To convert from minutes to seconds, recall there are 60 seconds in one minute. So we see omega rotations per minute times 2 pi r meters per one rotation times one minute per 60 seconds equals 2 pi r omega over 60 meters per second. In general, the formula is v equals 2 pi r omega, where r is the distance from the rotating point to the center of rotation, and omega is how fast the object is spinning. Let's look at an example problem. The Earth travels one revolution around the sun in one year. It is approximately 93 million miles from the sun. What is the Earth's linear speed in miles per hour? Let's use the formula v equals 2r omega with some unit changes. We have omega in units of revolutions per year. We can follow unit analysis to find the linear speed. One year has 365.25 days. There is a leap year every four years, which is equivalent to adding one quarter of a day to each year. And one day has 24 hours. Then one rotation is 2 pi r, where r is 93 million miles. So, we see the Earth is zipping around at 66,000 miles per hour. But, what if we are using degrees to measure an angle instead of radians? Our wheel with radius r is now rotating at 60 degrees per minute, and we would like to know the linear speed in feet per second. The easiest way is to add in one more unit conversion. Convert from degrees to rotations. Then you can use the same steps to find the linear speed. Degrees per minute times one rotation per 360 degrees times 2 pi r feet per one rotation times one minute per 60 seconds equals 2 pi r omega over 21,600 feet per second. In general, the formula is v equals 2 pi r omega over 180 where r is the distance from the rotating object to the center of rotation, and omega is how fast the object is spinning in degrees per second. Let's look at another example. On Chicago's Navy Pier, the Centennial Ferris wheel lifts passengers nearly 200 feet high. One ride lasts approximately 15 minutes, and you get to go around three times. What is your average linear speed in feet per second? First, we are given the diameter of the ferris wheel, not the radius. Recall, the diameter of a circle is two times the radius, so r equals 100 feet. Next, we need to figure out how fast we are rotating. We rotate three times in 15 minutes, which is equal to one rotation per five minutes. Now we can use v equals two pi r omega to find our linear speed to be approximately two feet per second. Understanding how and why things move has been the goal of scientists for thousands of years. Over time, calculations and experiments helped pave the way for a deeper understanding of motion, with Galileo Galilei defining the laws of gravity in the 1580s and Johannes Kepler pinning his laws of planetary motion in 1618. The basis of our current understanding of motion comes from Sir Isaac Newton's three laws of motion, which he established in 1687. In this video, we'll be discussing his first law of motion, also known as the law of inertia. Newton's first law of motion states that an object at rest will stay at rest, and an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted on by a net external force. This statement is much more intuitive than it sounds. One of the key things to remember, though, is that this law is only valid for objects in an inertial reference frame. An inertial reference frame is a frame of reference that is moving at a constant velocity. Let's think of it this way. When you kick a soccer ball and it soars through the air, the soccer ball isn't the only thing that's moving. Remember, we're on a planet that's rotating at about 1,000 miles per hour, our solar system is moving at about 140 miles per second, and our galaxy is rotating at 130 miles per second. So objects that we consider to be stationary on Earth are technically moving at a speed of almost one million miles per hour. 
However, it's generally pointless to include the motion of things like the solar system and Earth when we talk about the motion of things on Earth, like cars or people. What we do instead is use Earth as a point of reference, or an inertial reference frame. That is, we discuss the motion of objects in reference to Earth. Let's take a look at an object in an inertial reference frame that has a velocity of zero. It would seem that there are no net external forces acting on the car since the car isn't moving. But what about gravity? Isn't that an external force? While it's true that gravity is pulling the car downward toward Earth, the car is on the ground and the ground is providing a force in opposition to gravity. This force is called the normal force. Since you have two equal forces acting in opposite directions, the forces cancel out, meaning that the car does not move in the vertical direction. We define force by the symbol F, noting the force is a vector, which means it has both magnitude and direction. By doing this, we can state Newton's first law, mathematically, as the sum of the external forces is equal to the upward force of the ground on the car minus the downward force of gravity on the car, which is equal to zero. Note that the negative sign in front of the force of gravity indicates the downward direction of the force of gravity. This implies that the upward force is equal to the downward force. Now, let's imagine that someone comes along and pushes the car for a moment, providing an external force and giving it a small velocity. According to Newton's first law, once the external force is removed, the car should continue to move in a straight line with a constant speed for the rest of eternity unless some other external forces come along and change its speed or direction. Mathematically, we could state that the change in velocity with respect to time is zero. What we've just described is the constant motion of an object that is in a frame of reference with zero velocity. However, what if we made the car the inertial frame of reference and discuss the motion of the passengers inside it? Imagine if you and I were sitting in that car and there were no other objects around. In that frame of reference, you and I are not moving with respect to each other. We are both moving in the same inertial frame. If the car changed speed or direction, you would feel it because your body wants to keep moving in the straight line with constant speed. If we look at the head as an object moving in the inertial frame of reference of the car, if the car sped up, your head would feel like it's being thrown backwards. This is because the part of your body that is attached to the car would speed up too, but your head wants to obey the law of inertia and continue moving at a constant velocity, that is, with the same speed and direction. Similarly, if the car were to turn to the left or the right, your head, due to inertia, would feel like it was being moved to the right or left. Let's look at another simple example in which you are trying to push a piano across the stage for your performance at your high school graduation. We have already discussed what the forces should be in the vertical direction, where gravity is pulling the piano down and the stage is pushing back up, so there is no net force in the vertical direction. In the horizontal direction along the x-axis, we can add the pushing force and note that if the piano is not moving, there must be some other force pushing back against you. We can see that the resisting force of the piano is really the frictional force between the floor and the wheels of the piano and the friction in the wheel bearings. Since the piano has a constant speed of zero and no direction, we can state Newton's first law as the sum of the forces is equal to the push force minus the force of the piano. This implies that the positive push force is equal to the negative pull force from the piano. Okay. Let's wrap things up with a few review questions. Number one, which of the following is the most accurate version of Newton's first law? The correct answer is C. Number two, when you throw an object straight up, the object will slow down on its way up, stop for an instant, and then come back down with increasing speed in the opposite direction from its initial trajectory. Which of the following statements most accurately describes why this is the case? The correct answer is B. Number three, which of the following reasons describes why an object would not move when you push it? The correct answer is D. In this video, we will look at Newton's second law, compare it with his first law, and look at a couple of simple, common applications. 
Newton's second law states the acceleration of an object is directly proportional to the net external force applied, and it is indirectly proportional to its mass. In other words, more force generates more acceleration for a given mass, but more mass means less acceleration from a given force. Newton's second law is generally written in the form of F equals ma, where F is the net external force causing a mass, m, to undergo an acceleration, a. Since m is a positive quantity, the acceleration vector points in the same direction as the net external force vector. Newton's second law can be considered an extension of the first law for the situation where the sum of the net external forces is non-zero. As with Newton's first law, the internal forces are not included, and it can only be applied in an inertial frame of reference. Let's take a look at both a one-dimensional and a two-dimensional example to illustrate some applications of Newton's second law. Let's say you have someone pushing a piano across a stage. In this example, we are interested in the moment when the person pushes the piano with just enough force to get it moving. Let's set up the situation in which the first law holds, that is, the situation of translational equilibrium. The forces in the y direction, as we have seen, are the force of gravity downward and the force of the floor pushing up. In the x direction, we have the push force of the person in the positive x direction and the force of the piano pushing back in the negative x direction. When the person pushes with enough force to overcome the frictional forces resisting motion, the piano goes from a zero velocity to a non-zero velocity, and any change in velocity constitutes an acceleration. Thus, during the time when the velocity is changing, the net external force causes an acceleration, and Newton's second law comes into play. For the sake of completion, let's toss some numbers into our equation to get an idea of the numerical value of the acceleration. Let's say the frictional force between the wheels and the floor is 10 newtons, and the total friction in the bearings of the wheels is 10 newtons. Using Newton's first law for the x direction, we can calculate the net frictional force to determine the minimal force the person must push with. Newton's first law tells us that any pushing force greater than 20 newtons will get the piano moving. While the person may not have made the numerical calculation we did, they intuitively knew they had to push with a force greater than the number we calculated. So, let's say they push with a force of 30 newtons and calculate the acceleration using Newton's second law, assuming the piano has a mass of 200 kilograms. Restating Newton's second law as the sum of the external forces in the x direction is equal to the push force minus the force of the piano pushing back, substituting in the values we discussed and solving for the acceleration yields a value of 0.05 meters per second squared for the acceleration. We just used Newton's second law to calculate the acceleration of the piano in one direction given the external forces. Now that we know the acceleration, assuming it is constant based on the constant external forces applied, we could use the equations of motion with constant acceleration to calculate the time of travel and final velocity given the initial velocity and initial and final positions. In fact, given those three equations of motion for constant acceleration, you can find any three unknowns given the other parameters. Let's take a look at a 2D example using Newton's second law. In this example, we will also use a static inertial frame of reference fixed on the origin of our mass. Imagine you're involved in a three-way tug of war. Each person is 120 degrees from the other, and the x-axis is lined up with one of the warriors. Imagine, initially, each person pulled with equal force, and there is no motion, so Newton's first law applies. We can use vector math to show the force components from each person in the x and y directions, starting with the person on the right. We can see all of their force is directed in the x direction, so the force in the y direction is zero. The force from person two has components in the x and y directions, as shown. Similarly, the force from person three must be broken down into its x and y components, as shown. If we state Newton's laws for the three forces, we can see that Newton's first law holds. Let's say that the person aligned with the x-axis impulsively pulls with a force 1.3 times the force of the others. Using Newton's second law, we can calculate the acceleration of the center and the two people on the left. Let's assume that each person has the same mass of 50 kilograms and the rope has negligible mass. The mass of the system is then 150 kilograms. Now, let's say that F is equal to 100 newtons. 
Substituting those values into the force equation in the x direction and simplifying, we can calculate the acceleration. Intuitively, we know the direction of the acceleration is along the positive x-axis, and Newton's second law gives the quantitative value for the acceleration, which we calculated to be 0.2 meters per second squared. We just saw simple one-dimensional and two-dimensional applications of Newton's second law. When applying these principles to more complex examples, keep in mind that the concepts are the same, but the algebra may be a little more involved. Nonetheless, Newton's laws can be used to calculate the motion of all bodies in space, as long as they are moving in an inertial frame of reference. To wrap things up, let's go over a few review questions. Number one, true or false? Unlike Newton's first law, Newton's second law is valid for bodies in motion in both inertial and non-inertial frames of reference. The correct answer is false. Both Newton's first and second laws are similar in that they account for motion in inertial reference frames. Number two, true or false? Newton's second law is only valid for bodies with constant acceleration. The correct answer is false. Newton's second law can be used to find any acceleration. Number three, Calculate the acceleration of the body in the diagram, given the parameters indicated, assuming the mass is not lifted from the ground. Also calculate the force from the floor. Here's the correct calculation of the acceleration of the body, assuming the mass is not lifted from the ground. And here is the correct calculation of the force from the floor. That's all for this review. Thanks for watching and happy studying.